Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. Hello, I'm Mark Jones and I'll be part facilitator and part presenter for tonight. We also have Katie Forley from AHDB who will be in the background making sure everything runs smoothly tonight. Um, on your right hand side, hopefully you'll be able to see a questions tab and button. And uh, if you have any questions uh, throughout the webinar, please type away. Uh, the presentation will last about 40 minutes and then um, Jim, Reese, and myself will be available for questions at the end. Uh, these series of webinars have been jointly sponsored by AHDB, Field Options, Mobant and KWS. Field Options are a grass and forage sheep specialist and have been developing beet grazing systems in the UK for about 17 years. They currently have four grazing varieties available. Mamont is based in northeast France and are breeders of dual purpose for the beet. And then finally, we have KWS, who are a major breeder of sugar and for the beet in Europe. And they specialize in uh, improving crop establishment through high tech seed production. So tonight, we'll be talking about for the beet grazing systems for sheep, uh, ewe lambs, hoggets, and also for finishing lambs, for lambs. This is the fourth in a series of five webinars. Um, we've had transitioning of cattle and sheep. We've had beef, dairy, tonight is sheep. And on the 9th of November, we'll also have an agronomy one. So this series will also be running Wales over the next couple of weeks. So the speakers uh, tonight are firstly Rhys Owen from Field Options. So he specializes in the agronomy of grassland and forage crops and fodder beet and his basis in facts trained. With myself, Mark Jones, I'm an independent grass and forage consultant. Uh, I also farm and outwinter 350 dairy beef on fodder beet. I also outwinter around 500 uh, to 600 sheep on fodder beet as well. And uh, most importantly of all, uh, we've got Dr. Jim Gibbs. So he's a research scientist in ruminants and fishing at Lincoln University in New Zealand. He's also a trained veterinarian. And over the last 10 years, much of his research has concentrated on fodder beet. And he has pretty much single handedly been the main driver for the increase of fodder beet in New Zealand from 10 hectares to 70,000 hectares over a 10 to 15 year period. So to get us on our way, I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Jim Gibbs. Uh, thank you, Mark, and good evening to the uh, audience uh, coming to you from New Zealand. Um, I'm pleased to be here. This is the fourth in our series. And as Mark said, we're going to be spending our time on sheep and we should have plenty of times for questions today as well. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is to just reiterate some of the really important features of the fodder beet crop that lend themselves to sheep grazing and that are directly implicated in some of the problems you see with sheep grazing. Now we've already covered that material in the very first of these uh, webinars where we talked on transition, but I'll go over some basics there again. And then we'll specifically address both you and hogger wintering systems, and then look at some of the difficulties around lamb finishing systems what some of the alternatives are rather than uh, simply grazing it and spend a little bit of time on troubleshooting some of the issues that are seen. So we'll start with the fodder beet uh, basics. <clears throat> it's a very high yielding crop and it holds a very high energy density right across the growing period and well through the winter. And because it's a high yielding uh, crop, it functionally means that it's a cheap crop. So in previous webinars, we've stacked this up to look against uh, other feeds and what the cost of other feeds are. And similar to New Zealand, when you're looking in the UK experience with it, it's about the cheapest feed on the farm. And despite that, it happens to be a particularly high ME. So express on a, a pence per ME basis, it's very clearly the single most productive and highest energy forage that we have available. However, both of those things, the high ME and the high yields, present potential difficulties too that have to be managed around. And that's where we're going to spend our time. Note that the most important component and something that we'll return to several times uh, over the course of this with sheep is to recognise that the crop is actually presenting two very different feeds. 
it's presenting a bulb that is in a well-grown crop agronomically, approximately 75% of the total dry matter of the plant will be contained in that bulb. And that bulb will really only be a source of energy. It has uh, relatively low mineral content, a relatively low crude protein content, but a very high uh, sucrose content, which of course most of the UK audience would be familiar with. As a consequence, it's a very high energy source for the animals and particularly a rapidly fermentable carbohydrate source for the rumen. Now the leaf, 20% or so of the total dry matter of the plant is the principal provision of protein and necessary minerals for the animals that are grazing it. Now, uh, we bring this up in every webinar because it's important to notice, and we'll discuss this next week in the following webinar, that there's a very different agronomy for a grazing fodder beet crops than there is for sugar beet. And the reason is, is that leaf becomes an essential component of our management. And a lot of our agronomy in New Zealand in the last five years in particular has tilted towards producing more and more leaf with a higher and higher nitrogen content. Now, the other component of this crop, because of that, that becomes important is that it's always necessary to strip graze it. If you don't, then they'll go across and eat all of the leaf off and you'll see in a moment why that changes the way that they eat it. So the crop's never gonna be set stocked. It's always gonna be strip grazed. And so that gives you the opportunity to change your utilization and typically increase it. However, there is a fundamental issue with sheep that we need to discuss when we come to utilization because they typically won't eat very far into the ground. Now, the, the principal components of this as a crop that fit uh, sheep systems compared to other livestock classes are simply, as we've said, that it's a, a very cheap form of high energy. So that means in the case of uh, wintering pregnant ewes, of course, that it's got the capacity to supply even multiples without too much difficulty right across that period where otherwise forages are lacking. Very difficult to keep that uh, standing mass in front of you and of course very difficult to grow it at that time. Another component that fits sheep and this is again quite different to cattle is that the additional feed inputs in some form of supplement be that pasture or silage or a roughage input can be down to zero so they're very low even in uh, growing stock and can be effectively zero in use so that also impacts on the total cost of wintering and the very high yields mean that it can support a stocking rate across the whole of that period that effectively transfers animals on farm away from other areas on the farm. So in terms of the cost of cropping, that can be substantially reduced simply because you're using less hectares. But it also means that there can be uh, sacrificial paddocks across that time that uh, alter the, the winter damage bill to the whole of the farm. So it's a way of sparing pasture particularly. And there's a general rule of thumb with the modern agronomy around grazing systems, the, the protein's adequate for uh, nearly all of the sheep systems that we'll describe with the exception of lamb finishing, which we'll spend time on at the end. There's one point that um, is quite important as an extension of that to introduce here. And uh, that's how you work out what the crude protein of the crop is for the livestock class that you've got in front of you. Now, in the early years of grazing this in New Zealand, we spent quite some time <clears throat> putting out explanatory material, demonstrating how people could work out the total crude protein of the crop. And the way that we would do that would be to say, you can establish a crude protein content of the bulb and of the leaf, and you can establish the respective proportions of dry matter that they contribute to the crop. And for those of you looking for more information on that, in the first of the webinars, we spent quite some time uh, talking about uh, modern agronomic methods of establishing yield so you can allocate it well. But there's one important difference when it comes to sheep and that's the way that they eat it. Now, the fodder bee cultivars vary the distance and the mass of the bulb that they are into the ground. Now, some of them are very upright, so that towards the mangle, the older end, they're very upright and only 10% or so of them will be underground some of the uh, higher dry matter varieties, which are often promulgated for higher yield, can be 80% or so into the ground. Now, different to cattle, sheep get almost none of them out of the ground. They don't pull on the bulb and they don't tilt them over very commonly. The way that they eat them is in place. So the further they are in the ground, the less of the total bulb that they will eat out. 
Now, the first point to note about this is that doesn't automatically change your utilization. In most cases, what would happen, and on the photo in front of you, this is a good example. What would happen is uh, after the first livestock class, typically wintering ewes, has gone across that, towards the end of the season, um, those bulbs can be rapidly and very easily popped out of the ground with a grubber. And as a consequence, another livestock class is usually put in place to make the most of that. So the bulb utilization can still be approaching 100% in those circumstances. There's very little left behind. But what is changed is the crude protein of the diet of the first livestock class that went across it. And this is really important to um, make plain because there's some very poor information, particularly around sheep and the uh, protein nutrition of sheep wintering use specifically um, that's available. And uh, it's, it, it ignores the reality that not all of the bulb is eaten. And why that becomes important, and the photo that you have in front of you there is demonstrating the soil line on a, a relatively high dry matter variety to show you what mass is under the ground, is that it, it increases the crude protein always in a single direction. So because that bulb has a lower crude protein and the leaf has a higher crude protein, when you take away that fraction that the first livestock class are very likely not going to eat, if it's a palatable variety, they'll cup it out into the ground a little. And if it's not a palatable variety, they'll leave it bulbed on top of the ground. But either way, there'll be more than there will be in cattle systems that's left behind after the first livestock class. And that functionally means that that sheep crude protein is increasing. There's a second component that I'm not going to spend too much time talking about, but has been the subject of some of our direct research for many years. And that is the... Um, microbial protein production in the rumen. And suffice to say that because it's a very unusual rumen function when you have a lot of water, a lot of sugar, and a, a relatively different rumen nitrogen environment, the microbial protein production in beet fed ruminants is very high, substantially higher than ryegrass, for example. So when you put these together, what it means is that at first instance, even at a relatively low crude protein of 11 or 12 percent in the total plant, if it's been assessed, the actual crude protein content that's eaten by wintering users, one good example, when they first grow across this crop, is usually one to two points higher. So what that would functionally mean is if the total crude protein in the crop was established at 12 percent, it will typically be 13 or 14 percent in real terms for the first livestock class that goes across it. Now, with that, we're going to talk directly about uh, ewe wintering. Now, some of the things that uh, lend this crop to ewe wintering, we've already discussed, but specifically the fact that it's a very high ME intake and these animals have the capacity for a relatively high intake expressed against their own live weight, uh, higher than it is for many of the other foragers, uh, simply on the basis of a relatively restricted fibre content of the crop. And this means that the energy supply to multiple use in particular is excellent. Uh, some of the very current research that's been going on uh, this year uh, in New Zealand in my research group has been looking specifically at how well different wintering diets meet the energy and metabolizable protein requirements of uh, use and larger and multiple use in particular. And suffice to say on that one that well agronomically well-grown beet crops do an excellent job at meeting both the energy and metabolizable protein requirements of use. So there's a, there's a natural fit for it. The second component is that it can be quite difficult in various circumstances to have um, a lot of supplement put into some of the systems where ewes are being wintered. Sometimes there's a weather restriction on that. Sometimes there's just a logistical restriction on that. Because there's actually very little supplement that's required, again, in agronomically well-grown crops, I, I, I reiterate that because if the leaf has not been supplied through positive agronomy, then it can be very difficult to supply that. And as a general rule, production will be restricted as a result. But assuming that the leaf is there and it's 25 odd percent of the total dry matter of the plant and it's agronomically well cared for, so it holds well into winter, then the amount of supplement that can be fed into that system can be reduced to almost zero or in certain cases, zero. Uh, 
And the final bit with ewes in general is that unlike cattle, uh, the sheep don't have the same issues with transition onto the crop. There, there functionally is no transition onto beet crops for sheep. They regulate their intake in a different manner and it's vanishingly rare to see clinical acidosis in uh, sheep or even for that matter, uh, animals that have been um, induced into feed aversion by subclinical acidosis. It's vanishingly rare to, sheep, so to see in any uh, sheep flocks on this. So as a consequence, it's a relatively easy feed, it's a pretty safe feed and it's a really productive feed for ewes. Now, some of the things that are different, again, from cattle and really have to be looked at pretty carefully, uh, the fact that uh, sheep are a bit more sensitive to the cultivar that's used. One part of that is um, how far they'll eat it into the ground, as we've already discussed. But there's also a sensitivity to palatability of different crops. There's a clear difference in palatability between different cultivars. Some are really palatable and some are not so palatable. And it's much easier to get them onto those that are palatable and they'll typically have higher intakes on the palatable uh, varieties as well. Now, one component of that that uh, can override even those cultivar differences is agronomy. Now, that agronomy has shifted a lot in recent years, but it's, it's possible by uh, shifting inputs to change the nitrogen content of the bulb, to increase the crude protein content of the bulb, and to increase both the amount of leaf and the nitrogen content of the leaf. And both of those things uh, lend themselves to higher palatability cultivars. So agronomically uh, abused crops typically aren't as palatable as those that are treated well. So that crude protein shift that you get with that, more leaf, higher nitrogen content in the leaf, higher nitrogen content in the bulb, drives intake. So those systems uh, feed on themselves. So in every one of these webinars, we've made the point that for fodder beet grazing systems, agronomy is a principal management tool. And then there's one final thing to mention that uh, does become an issue with you wintering. And that is that the allocation again is, and the means of allocation and the strategy behind allocation is very different from cattle. Those of you who listened into the um, beef uh, webinar in particular would note that we spent quite some time pointing out that the intake pattern for cattle is very different on beef than other root crops even. And that if you want to achieve maximum intakes, you have to have three days on the ground when you go to move the line. Now, that's not true in sheep. In fact, we call it the Goldilocks allocation in sheep. Because if you over allocate in sheep, what they'll do is they'll keep eating the leaf. They'll eat a minimum part of the bulb. So they'll often chew off the tops and we'll see some photos uh, before the end of this webinar on just that. They'll chew the top off that bulb and then they'll keep going. Now, number one, your utilization for that stock class is relatively low. But the second component is more important in that the leaf is a lower ME contribution than what the bulb is. And it's very important to match well that leaf and the bulb. And if you over allocate, you don't do so. Now, if you under allocate, you don't automatically drive the sheep to eat more. So for example, if you under allocate, you won't necessarily drive them to eat it further into the ground. Uh, they'll stop at a certain point, they'll stop. And all you're doing is you're restricting production. Now, particularly in the case of uh, wintering ewes and multiples um, specifically, this can result in some metabolic issues if it's closer to lambing. So that allocation has to be quite sensibly done. As a general rule of thumb, the allocation should work out about 3% of the ewes weight in dry matter a day. So uh, it's, a, it's a straightforward enough allocation rule to work on and it won't be too far away. But what are some of the practical things that um, have to be done? Well, the first one we should mention up front is that uh, sheep, like younger cattle, but more so, are highly susceptible to clostridial disease while on crop, particularly um, clostridial perfringens type D, um, which would be known as pulpy kidney to many in the audience. So even in adult use, losses can be quite strong if they don't have a current vaccination. So just note there that there's, um, there's no requirement for some of the more contemporary vaccination strategies on that, which are used for different clostridial um, uh, variants. This is, is very, def very definitely clostridium perfringens type D, and it's covered by the older clostridial vaccines. However, the challenge is very strong. Um, perfringens uh, becomes a problem if there's an overgrowth in the 
early part of the small intestine, principally as a result of increased sugar content. Because the sugar content is very high in beet and the water content is very high in beet, what you find is that there's a very strong flows of that sugar past the room into the small intestine. And so there's a tremendous uh, challenge that's put on the animal. Now, vaccine can meet that challenge, vaccination strategies that is, can meet that challenge well, but it is important that they have a, uh, uh, an up-to-date vaccine before going on that crop. In most cases, uh, there's not going to be any worm burden on that crop, so typically they're drenched before they go on. Note that one of the supplement strategies uh, can be co-grazing. So it's a, a very common strategy, for example, in large uh, ewe flocks in New Zealand, to have uh, 200 grams or so of dry matter and pasture given every second day. And they will typically be on an adjacent paddock where they can be uh, taken off, put on, and then put back onto the crop. Now, in those cases, there's a continuing worm burden across the season, so you have to be more careful with drench. But if it's only conserved feeds that are being fed with that crop, then that uh, having drenching them before they go on solves that problem. And then the, the other issue that has to be uh, carefully looked at in different environments is their trace element status. Now, this varies from region to region and um, even within regions. So local veterinary advice is really important in these circumstances. But two common difficulties that are found on um, beet crops are selenium and copper. Uh, very high um, water loads in selenium can mean in some instances in relatively low selenium soils that it's, it's relatively straightforward to drag animals down into deficiency and that can have some uh, effects around lambing. Quark uh, also can on occasion be an issue in those places that either have very high molybdenum in the soil or relatively low copper. There's a reasonably high soil intake in beet, so those trace elements have to be looked at quite carefully. In, in terms of practical transition to the crop, sheep don't have the same transition that cattle do, and the requirement isn't there to allocate them in the same manner. As a general rule of thumb, the way that sheep are transitioned on is to be run on and off the crop for a couple of hours, for a couple of days, and then to be locked on. Now, it's, it's worth noting that um, in some of the specific research work, we've demonstrated before that their time to total intakes is almost identical to what it is in cattle. So it's just that sheep regulate their own intakes uh, much more effectively than cattle do, and you don't see clinical acidosis. Um, it's, it, it's extraordinarily rare to have any difficulties on transition to the crop, with the exception of the clostridials. Um, particularly in uh, younger animals, which we'll get to towards the end of this webinar, if they're not adequately vaccinated, then the losses can be quite high and typically they'll just be sudden death. But in most cases, what would happen with transition is that the animals are simply introduced to that crop, uh, or sheep quite like the leaf and rapidly adapt to eating the bulb. They won't make their full intakes till about three weeks later, but in that early part, within a few days even, they can be happily locked onto the crop and uh, their supplement inputs that they're gonna have for the rest of the season can be in place. In terms of the practical paddock design, therefore there isn't the same uh, genuine need for a headland in the way that there is with cattle or for a runoff paddock. Now, in some cases, um, wet weather dependent, it, it's a great idea to have space next door where they can move off that crop, particularly uh, in heavier soils where there's a, a great mud load and burden. And, and so local advice is, um, is normally required on that. But as a general rule, um, the allocation per day is going to work out a, a little bit under um, one U per square metre for most of the crops that are currently grown in the UK. As the crops get bigger and bigger, then that falls down lower, of course. But we, we have two measures that we use for this. The first one is that the upper limit is about four U's per linear metre of the hot wire in front of you. So if you're going beyond that, typically narrow paddocks like that, you'll have utilisation losses in the leaf as there's more and more animals tramping that in the early stages. It's not as bad as cattle and uh, in, certainly in circumstances you can get away with it, but it's a great rule of thumb to work forward on. And we've already spoken around that allocation, um, but a, a practical issue with that allocation is sometimes around that time of transition. So in most cases what will happen is that more space will be given to them, which will mean that in that early uh, transition phase, they'll eat off all of the leaf first, 
and they'll often have an extended period where they have more bulb on the ground. So it's just worth noting that at that point, they no longer have the balance of um, energy from the bulb and protein from the leaf. And as a general rule of thumb, if they grow about 72 hours or so with really low crude proteins, and by that I mean the crude proteins that are found in only in the bulb, then what will happen is their intake will start to drop. So in those circumstances, uh, more attention is normally required at that time of transition if you're allocating a lot to make space for them in the paddock. Now this is an example of allocation gone catastrophically wrong. So you can see here, as you look carefully at those um, bulbs in front, they're hardly eaten at all, and yet all of the leaf is gone. Now, in this case, the um, farmer was a new entrant to big and uh, just kept moving that line because the, the animals were being fed um, a relatively high level of supplement. So there was no great reason for them to be introduced. Uh, agronomically, this crop was poor. It was a cultivar that they don't particularly like anyway, and it had been made worse by the agronomy that was provided. So you can see that they were refusing to eat it was almost universal. And his response to that was to continue moving the line forward and you get to a point there where that utilization is just awful. And on top of that, their diet is really poor and very poorly productive. A question comes up a lot, um, can you do more than daily breaks? And yes, you can. In fact, in sheep, it's very common to do uh, two day breaks and on occasion, three day breaks. It's worth reiterating what we've just said before though, that in the first uh, period of that first break, they will eat all of the leaf. And they'll certainly eat that within 24 hours. So if you, if you stretch beyond that two or three day break, certainly if you're going anywhere beyond three day breaks, as a general rule of thumb, you're gonna run into intake depression. What you'll find is that they don't have the same balance of energy and protein and they'll just reduce their intakes. Now that's not in, in uh, multiples in particular, closer to lambing, that can be a big problem because as that intake goes down, their energy supply obviously goes down and you can run into uh, ketosis and syndromes of sleepy sickness. And then the final one on a practical level is to talk about the supplement uh, inputs into the system. Uh, as a general rule, about 100 grams of dry matter a day of um, a relatively high quality and higher protein is used. It would be relatively common in very leafy crops in certain environments where that's difficult to use, no supplement at all. Now, just note, if, if you don't have a leafy crop and that leaf doesn't contribute about 25% of the total dry matter, then some supplement needs to be going in. The protein supply for that will be poor, the intakes will be poor, and you'll end up, despite being surrounded by energy, with an energy deficit. So that supplement will become very important. Note again, in line with the previous webinars, particularly when we spoke on transition, that supplement allocation and supplement access aren't automatically the same thing. Being, putting out a medium round that has 200 kilos of dry matter in it, um, you know, potentially that's going to be 2,000 sheep in a day and everybody will understand that they're not going to get 2,000 sheep around a single bale feeder. So wherever possible, it's cheaper and more effective to use co-strip grazing uh, arrangements. Because they're on multi-day breaks, they can be walked on or off that without too much trouble. That means that they might get the grass or um, sometimes standing cereals, for example, every second day. And they can be walked off, they can consume that, and then they can be walked back on. So now we'll move to uh, the growing out stock. <clears throat> so in the case of this, hoggets and ewe lambs and using them across that winter. Um, it's important to note that um, there's, there's quite some common misconceptions around this. And the, the main misconception is that you can't do it. <clears throat> that the protein requirement in um, beets isn't high enough and that they won't eat it and, and there's issues with it. I want to be really clear on this one. This is it's completely false. Um, I mean, some years of doing this and in recent years, specifically looking with research trials at intake and protein nutrition in these animals has demonstrated that you can do it very well. However, it is more stringent and the type of crop that you put in front of them becomes much more important in the hoggets than it is in the ewes. And a little bit more planning is normally required simply because the supplement provision has to be very carefully in place. Having said that, what we've demonstrated in recent years, some work by Nadisha J. Singer in particular uh, here at Lincoln has demonstrated that 
these uh, animals uh, up to 50 and 60 kilos can achieve very high intakes of extremely low dry matter material. So uh, she, she demonstrated that their intakes can be well above 3% of their live weight in dry matter terms and that they could sustain uh, live weight increases of 200 grams a day, up to 200 grams a day uh, on the crop. So there's no question that they can do very well. And there's a number of people who, uh, a very large number of people who do extensive outdoor grazing of hoggets and uh, achieve excellent results and have done for many years. Having said that, it's a very easy system to topple over. And that system would really start with the agronomy again. Um, they are progressively more sensitive to palatability and the cultivar in front of them. So note again that that has two components to it. One is the cultivar itself will have a palatability index. And then the second component of that is that the agronomy will change the palatability of all the cultivars. It'll change the amount of leaf, it'll change the amount of nitrogen in the leaf and the bulb. And as a consequence, the, the animal's preference for it. Now this becomes very important in the younger stock because they're still growing out. Their protein requirements are a point or two higher than what even the multiples are uh, closer to the term. And so as a consequence, if you fall under that 25% leaf as dry matter, it's very easy to drop them into territory where their protein requirements aren't being met. And in my personal experience with troubleshooting on these crops, when people uh, are saying that their hoggets haven't done very well, it has ordinarily started with their selection of cultivar and the agronomy that they've provided that cultivar with before putting the animals on. Um, it's, it couldn't be overstated the, uh, the importance of that in these animals. What that practically means also is it may change the management. And by management, um, specifically talking about the multiple day breaks um, for, for hoggets, it, uh, anything beyond two day breaks can become problematic. Uh, they are much more sensitive to that uh, protein and energy balance that you're providing them with, and they'll still go across and eat all the leaf first, and they'll be left with an extended period of time without that protein input, which reduces their intake of the bulb. So as a general rule, it'll also change that management. And a supplement in most cases is going to be required. And the best supplement that can be put in with this system is pasture. So wherever possible, uh, multi-day on-off grazing of a relatively small amount of pasture, so it can be 150 grams um, of dry matter of pasture per animal, is uh, a very simple solution to a lot of the issues around them. However, if the leaf is very low, then progressively more and more pasture is required. And as a general rule, this dilutes out the energy of the diet and it becomes problematic. And of course, it can be logistically very difficult to do. Now, if pasture isn't available, then high quality silage um, can partially mitigate this. But in most cases, if it's wet enough that pasture can't be provided, it can be quite difficult to give them access to the supplement with large enough mobs in the provision that they need. So for example, if it's a very wet environment and bales are being fed out, then they'll often be in bale feeders and it's really easy to feed them too much supplement, which will reduce their beet intake and reduce their production on it. On the other hand, if there's enough of them, it's very difficult for them all to get around the bales. So there are some issues around that provision of supplement. Now the final system that we're going to talk about is um, lamb finishing. And the, the first thing to say about this is that lamb finishing is not typically a viable option on beet. The, the requirement, the crude protein requirement in the diet for lambs to do really well on it is above 16% crude protein in the diet. And even with the peculiar rumen environment with sugar and relatively high microbial protein production on beet, as a general rule of thumb, the crop uh, is not going to provide enough protein with that. It, it's worth noting that um, sometimes what has been said is that you can put another uh, supplement in of a higher crude protein. So um, just to put some bones on that idea, which um, isn't usually effective, because beet is going to constitute the majority of the diet and because the benefits of beet being cheap and high energy mean that it really has to be the majority of the diet for the system to be viable, then to raise the crude protein from 12 or 13%, which is common in the total crude protein status of a beet crop, up to where it's needed, it requires quite a lot of um, crude protein going in. So for example, if we were gonna raise it from 13% to 17%, then 
even if we were using a 50-50 mix, then what we're going to be putting in is a material with a crude protein above 20%. And of course, that's going to be very expensive if you're putting it in at 50%. If you're looking to use a very small amount, so for example, some of the high protein nuts, et cetera, then as a general rule of thumb, you using them at uh, the relatively restricted rates that we would, then it's impossible to get that crude protein in the nut high enough to get the total diet crude protein suitable for really good lamp finishing. So it can be a very difficult system to work with in our uh, normal grazing environment. I'll, I'll note in passing that all of the issues that we've talked about with the young stock growing out on in, in the previous slide are exacerbated in lambs. They're spectacularly sensitive to clostridial um, uh, disease if they're not well vaccinated before they go onto the crop. They're very fussy, the single most fussy livestock class across them. So they're very sensitive to the cultivar and they're very sensitive to the agronomy of that crop to get them to do well on it. And as a general rule, because that finishing won't achieve the live weight gains that we like, and so it's, it's certainly possible to get in uh, alternative forages across that winter period to get three and 400 grams a day live weight gain. And when, we're never going to do that on, uh, on beef systems without an expensive and relatively difficult supplement input. So as a consequence, its use in New Zealand in lambs has been uh, radically altered. It's not, it's not uh, very difficult to do approximately 100 grams a day, even with a simple co-grazing pasture system uh, of a very small amount of grass every second day. And what that um, has lent itself is a use where it's effectively been used as a fish tank, where a very large number of lambs could be bought in a season where they're cheaper and then held for finishing on other forages. So effectively like a large ATM, and they can be taken out in trenches and then finished on grass or some other higher crude protein forage in those circumstances. Now, if there's a high supplement input and the, the market was right for it, then achieving live weight gains of about 200 grams a day is possible. But in, in general terms, with that grazing system that we've described for the others, it can be quite difficult to do. So the alternative uh, system that um, is much more effective with lambs is to flip that on its head and to use pastures in places where it's possible to do so. Pastures across those higher um, livestock pricing times where the schedule is better and use the excess nitrogen in the pasture along with the high energy of the beet bulb as a way of effectively increasing the stocking rate on that pasture and increasing the total ME of the diet. And the way that that would normally be done is that they'd be put in one to two day breaks and they'd be strip grazed to establish a diet that is effectively a 50% pasture input and a 50% beet input in terms of the total dry matter. Now, with that, going back to what we'd said before, the crude protein, the total crude protein in the diet for finishing lambs can be met somewhere around about 16 or 17% without too much difficulty. And it's a very easy and workable system because it can be set up well in advance. So for example, what happens in this case is that um, a beet bucket, a, a simple apparatus um, like on the screen in front of you can be used <clears throat> to pick up the beet and it can be fed out through normal silage wagons. And on a single day of the week, it can be fed out seven or 14 days in advance. And it can be spread across the pasture to the right dry matter allocation for the animals that are there. And then every second day or so, that uh, hot wire is simply moved. And so the new material is um, included in their, in their ration. And utilization for beet on pasture is functionally 100%. So it's an extremely high utilization of the beet. And of course, they're getting the benefit of having that grazing in front of them. So this system of land finishing is a very uh, straightforward and viable alternative. And of course, there are some benefits in um, certain cropping arrangements in having uh, high intensity grazing for shortish periods of time with relatively light stock. So it's a system that can be adapted to a few particular uses. Um, it's a more difficult system to get right if you're using anything over two day breaks. So uh, one of the things is it's a little bit more labor intensive. I mean, there's a day of the week where this material is being put out and that often has to fit the weather depending on the season that's being done. But as a general rule of thumb, that protein and energy balance becomes really important. As a consequence, they'll be done on two day breaks. <clears throat> 
So we'll finish up here with a couple of slides on troubleshooting. And these are the three that um, are most commonly discussed in, uh, in sheep systems. I'll add one here that um, a particular extension of these difficulties in new wintering systems is the, the sudden advent of ketosis or sleepy sickness in the period running up to lambing. And it's associated with these problems that we'll discuss here. So, so the first of these is that what would happen is people would report that there's relatively poor production on this. So that could be in a couple of ways in younger stock that would be live weight gains or in ewes, it would be holding body condition or increasing body condition and meeting targets across that season. Uh, one that's uh, relatively commonly associated with that in the first part is that there's some difficulty in that transition period in uh, achieving good intakes from the animals on that crop. And in nearly all cases with poor production, there'll be one of two things that have been involved. The first one is that the allocation will have been mistakenly reduced. Now, note that that can sometimes mean that the allocation was actually too high. So in, in places where the allocation is too high, they'll go across and they'll leave the leaf and they'll leave that energy rich bowl behind. And as a consequence of that, the total energy content of their diet is falling. So if they're only eating the leaf as they move across that, they're not getting the same good production that they will if they're also eating that bulb. So that allocation can be paradoxically too high and give them the same issue. Uh, a not uncommon one though, is that the allocation will be too low. And in this case, what will happen, particularly in poorly palatable cultivars, that the farmer will look down and see that they're leaving um, cricket ball sized knobs on top of the ground, figure that there's plenty for them to eat. And if he just pushes them a little bit harder, then, um, then they'll eat it. And that isn't the case. In poorly um, palatable cultivars, they'll just stop eating rather than eat them, particularly if they've been agronomically challenged. Now, that is very similar to what will be seen after the initial difficulties in getting them onto the crop. Now, the, the major difficulties in getting them onto the crop are leaf quality. So if the leaf quality is really high, so if there's good quality, high nitrogen and low dry matter leaf in front of them, then that's the pull to get them onto eating bulb. So if that leaf quality is low, so agronomically challenged crops or crops that have been used um, very late, and put on in challenging, difficult weather, they can all be a problem in getting them to, uh, get, to achieve normal intakes on the crop. One thing though, is that uh, overriding all of that, again, the, the cultivar becomes important. And as a general rule of thumb, the deeper they are in the ground, the more difficult it'll be for sheep to get onto them. Now, good agronomy can mitigate that to a large extent, and some of the deeper varieties are acceptably palatable to sheep, but as a general rule of thumb, the further they are into the ground, the more difficult it is. And of course, the other one that we've spoken about is um, the clostridial deaths. You very, very rare to see a sick animal. In this case, they'll just be dead. They'll usually be the good ones. So, uh, similarly with poppy kidney on other forages, and it is completely preventable by effective vaccination. Note, in younger stock, um, you have to be quite careful with that vaccination. You pretty much will find all the ones that you missed if you were going through in a hurry. So that vaccination becomes really important. And the final one I'll leave you on is this uh, ketosis and sleepy sickness in ewes. The most common um, signalment of this syndrome in ewe flocks on beet is where the farmer has over allocated. So what will happen in those cases is that they will have typically done long day breaks. So they might be on three or four day breaks and they've over allocated to give plenty of food. In those cases, as they get closer to lambing, their energy requirements are quite high and their metabolizable protein requirements are also quite high. So what will happen is that they'll eat off all the leaf in the first period, they'll be left with a lot of energy rich bulb all around them. But after about a three day period, their intakes on that will drop and they'll drop significantly because despite having that energy rich bulb around them, they won't eat it. And as a consequence there, you can get widespread sleepy sickness across those groups, despite being surrounded by feed and high energy feed of that. So going back to that management, the leaf and bulb management and your uh, management in allocating correctly is the solution for all of these difficulties. And with that, we'll turn it back to Mark and Therese and we'll take questions from the audience. <clears throat> Great, thanks very much, Jim. Right, I'll just find my questions tab. Uh, 
Right. So um, the first question I thought I'd uh, put across to, to Reese to get you involved um, from the off. Uh, what has your experience been with farmers uh, you've been advising over the last few years? Have there been any issues or, or questions farmer, farmers have had specifically on the crop? Um, I know keeping leaf in very hard winters um, has been an issue, but we've had beast from the east and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, I'll just hand over to you, Rhys, to start. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, experience on the whole with fodder beet has been very, very good. Um, I think personally and as a, as a company, um the growth in the sheep sector um you know growing fodder beet for wintering ewes that is where 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 the growth we're seeing is um in terms of retaining tops really i think we will discuss agronomy fuller in next week's uh, webinar but really it'd be selection of variety or cultivar as jim has, has mentioned through through the webinar um nutrition as well um you know adequate nitrogen and potash um that will that will retain the top in, in, into winter um pest and disease control as well uh, in the uk um different to new zealand we have lost some of our neonicotinoid seed treatments um so we are fully sort of dependable on foliar insecticides or aphicides so regular mm. monitor monitoring of the crop early on um to reduce that you know, barley, barley, you know, the, the beet yellows virus, sorry, the beet yellows virus um, and, and aphid numbers early in the crop. Um, treating once, once, the, once the crop reaches threshold, so that's one green wingless aphid um, per four plants. And that is a very small threshold. And believe me, this this spring, um, there was a big, massive aphid population. So there are, there are a lot of crops out there this year which are challenged by uh, by the yellows virus. Good. Um, thanks, Rhys. Uh, next question coming in uh, for Jim. Transitioning cattle is very important, but uh, what about sheep? Mm. Yeah, it, it certainly is very important for cattle to transition them properly, both from an animal health uh, perspective and also from a production perspective. And that um, two week odd transition period on introduction to the crop can mean the difference for the profit for the whole season. Uh, it can be wiped away in beef systems uh, really quickly and easily by not doing that well. And it's the responsibility of the, uh, the operator to manage that uh, introduction to the feed. They won't manage it themselves. Sheep, on the other hand, manage it very well. Um, they regulate their intake uh, really differently. Interestingly, in grain-based rations, um, they don't seem to. So it's still um, relatively straightforward to provoke uh, clinical ruminacidosis in high grain environments. For example, drought feeding is a, is a relatively common one in Australia and New Zealand where they're fed grain. And though, although they do regulate their grain intakes better than cattle, you can still have some difficulties. But the regulation of beet intake is, uh, is excellent. And it's just vanishingly rare to see uh, acidosis syndromes in beet. You, in a career, I've seen uh, half a handful. Um, note though, the, the same underlying processes are in play and where the research in recent years has looked specifically at this, it's still approximately three weeks before they achieve their maximum intakes. So all of the processes around the changes in the rumen and the changes in the rest of the animal, particularly in coping with that water load, uh, that we've discussed in previous webinars are in play. The actual regulation of the rate of intake, so that if you like how fast they're shoveling coal into the boiler, sheep do much better. And so on a practical level, that does change management. Um, as we said, the headlands aren't such an issue. And on top of that, um, you, you normally can run them on and off for a couple of days and then lock them on. There's, there's other things that are much more important, allocation particularly in sheep systems, not, not so much transition. Good. Thanks, Jim. Um, next question, then. Can you explain protein in more depth? Um, and is it enough for multiples, so twins and triplets? Yeah. Yeah, it's, the, the protein nutrition, I think, is, is widely um, misunderstood and, and probably hasn't helped that there's some um, 
very uh, very poor information that's been um, promulgated to farming communities in certain circumstances in recent years. And uh, all of the recent research has been in one accord and been in, in one line. And that is that if you've got really high sugar environments, and of course beet can be 50% sucrose by dry matter in the bulb, so it's a very high fermentable carbohydrate load, you've got an, an energy rich ruminant environment that is capable of sustaining a microbial population that can make the most of nearly all of the nitrogen that it's presented with. So microbial protein production has been demonstrated for some years, beginning with Sophie Prendergast and myself in 2015, we demonstrated that microbial protein production was significantly exaggerated above even good quality ryegrass in uh, winter systems. And in more recent times, we've demonstrated live weight gains from relatively low nitrogen uh, total crude protein diets in beet that are um, anomalous. It's not what you would normally see. So a component of that is that you have this much stronger room and nitrogen efficiency in use. Um, the other component though, I think that's misunderstood in sheep is, is what we mentioned with the amount that's left under the ground. So where people have moved to higher and higher dry matter varieties, are often mistakenly chasing yield, frankly, then what's happened is that the first livestock class, commonly wintering ewes that goes across them, is actually getting a much higher crude protein diet than people have been given credit for. And largely that was because in the very initial stages, um, we we promulgated ways to understand the total crude protein in the crop by, as we said, measuring the crude protein of the bulb representatively and that of the leaf representatively. And in the early days, we were commonly using cultivars, the restricted cultivars that were a lot further out of the ground where most animals, including sheep, ate nearly all of them. Now, in those cases, that is the crude protein in the crop. But when 50% or in some cases 80% of that bulb is underground, it's not the crude, total crude protein of that diet at all. And I think that's been a fundamental misunderstanding in sheep protein. So as a consequence, uh, agronomically well looked after crops with good yields in recent times will commonly have a crude protein the other side of 13%. Now it's a brave person who tries to pretend that the total crude proteins on that level are not adequate for even relatively large heavy wintering use. Uh, for the audience that are interested, the you know total for an 80 kilo U, a very large U, uh, with tri triples, the FRC metabolizable protein intakes um, that we've calculated in recent times for them, their requirements are about 140 or 150 grams a day. And uh, that's easily met by the intakes that we can achieve on beet that's agronomically well grown. Okay, so just a, a couple more questions linked to that really. Um, the first one being um, how long before lambing is it recommended to pull the ewes off the beet in order to keep up with their nutrition requirements? So two, three, four weeks prior to lambing. A lot of people in the UK will either be taking them straight off the fodder of beets and housing them for lambing or, or even going straight to grass to, to set stock and lamb. Yeah, it'd be similar in New Zealand. Um, it, I mean, there's two points on that. I, if you if you took industry practice here, it'd be most common to pull them off a couple of weeks before beet and to set stock them, so be on pastures. So set stock them then on uh, pretty good quality, pretty good cover pastures. And there'd be a practical reason for that, they, um, giving them a, a cleaner, drier environment where they're not gonna be moved for a period of time to get, get through lambing. And that would be most common. It's worth noting though, that physiologically and from a nutritional perspective, there's um, no automatic advantage in taking them off um, before lambing. I mean, in many cases, if the crop's well grown and the allocation management are really good, then their metabolizable energy intake will be higher on the beet than it subsequently is on the pasture, particularly if that pasture cover is relatively high. So the way that that's managed, I guess, in most of the sheep systems here is that through the earlier part of that uh, gestation period on crop, they will have been uh, accumulating body condition. And then that body condition will drive that latter part of gestation and also uh, into early lactation. So there's not a prima facie reason to remove them off the crop. And I mean, there are some systems that land them on the crop. They're a specialist system and they have to be 
there, there are some careful requirements around that. So it, it's not for people who are doing it for the first time, but, but it is possible to do it. The, the general way would be two or three weeks before lambing that they'd be pulled off and set stocked, or in the case in the UK, that they'd be housed at that point and uh, put onto their um, lambing ration. Okay. Um, moving on to the 3% allocation that you mentioned earlier, uh, does this include the 25% in the ground? Yes, the, the, the short answer uh, is yes. If if you look through, we would often be, depending on your use size, of course, if they're larger use, it ships a bit, but we'd often be allocating something around two and a half kilograms of dry matter a day out of the beet. So whatever supplement might be in addition to that. So um, that um, normally is taking into account the proportion of the cultivar that's underground. Now, in, uh, in recent times, what we've been working on is a, a simple rule of thumb, which we're gonna to promulgate to farms to demonstrate for the different types of cultivars, on average, uh, how much is left in the ground. Now, it's really important to reiterate, this doesn't automatically mean that you've wasted that. In fact, in almost no cases is this wasted on farm. It just means that the first livestock class to go across it isn't eating it. And it's eaten at the end of the season, often by a very different livestock class. And so what we're wanting to do is to promulgate this to give people a better understanding about protein nutrition. So. If, uh, if you're working on a deeper, uh, higher dry matter variety, and uh, as a general rule of thumb, they're not, they're not the preferential varieties for grazing sheep on anyway, but in those circumstances where you were, we might raise that allocation to about 3.5%. But um, in most cases, that 3% holds. Okay, good. Um, how does and then um, in terms of uh, that movement uh, back to grass, is there a transition required from the pod of to grass? Yeah, no, not at all. The transition typically is open the gate and whistle the dog um, uh, and they're out there onto the pasture as quick as they can. That's a very, a very common misconception that um, I think New Zealand is responsible for, I'm sad to say. Um, you know, for whatever reason, a, a number of people have promulgated that uh, in recent years. And it's just, just completely false. I mean, as, as we've said for beef before, there is a period of um, adaptation to any new feed. And that adaptation from a production point of view can take a little while before they're at full intakes and full function. But moving back to grass in particular, we've demonstrated for many, many years that the, the difference in intake uh, from, uh, from beet to grass is always in the positive zone. So in other words, their intakes always increase immediately when they go back onto grass. So while it might be true that there's a slight period of time when they're re-equilibrating to higher and higher optimum intakes of a, of a new feed, really it's an academic point. There's no transition at all. The transition is really in cattle to avoid rumen acidosis and feed aversion. And you don't see that in sheep moving onto the crop and you certainly don't see it when you're moving off onto set stocking. No, open the gate, whistle the dog. Yes. Um, in terms of clostridial cross, cross uh, vaccines, um, if the ewes are already in the program, so they're getting their annual boosters uh, quite often pre lambing, um, are they okay or do they need a, an extra clostridial vaccine before they go on? No, no, that's effective. If they're getting pre lambing uh, clostridials anyway, then um, that's effective. Because the challenge is so high, I mean, they're eating a lot of sugar, they're eating a lot of water that washes that sugar to the small intestine, and they're typically eating quite a lot of soil, which there'll be clostridial spores in as well. The, the challenge is a whole lot higher. So if you like the normal animal health seesaw, where you've got the challenge and then the animal's response is a bit exaggerated because you have got a very strong challenge in this case. So that pre-lambing uh, five in one typically is, um, is really necessary, even in adult stock. Uh, however, when you move down to the younger stock, it becomes critical. You really do find all the ones that you missed. So if it, particularly in circumstances where lambs are being held on them at really high stocking rates. And, you know, the stocking rates for lambs to be used, uh, bought early in autumn for us typically and used in a holding tank variety, the stocking rate is well over 200 a hectare. So it's extremely high stocking rates for extended periods of time. And in those cases, making sure that they've had two clostridial vaccines before they get onto crop is really important. They had, uh, the losses can start being seen within a short time after being on that crop. So that's slightly different, but pre-lambing is a very effective way of doing it. Okay. Um, just going back to 
protein, but more for the hogs and lambs now. Um, have you had any experience of feeding high protein legume silage, so I suppose like leucine um, as a supplement yeah. um, via a back fence or something like that that's being rolled out? Yeah, and so the earliest research that we were doing was looking at you know what proportion of relatively high crude protein uh, supplements do you require in uh, very young animals. So in our case, we were looking at finishing lambs originally to meet their protein adequacy, and and you know functionally even with loosened sil loosen silage, really good quality loosened silage, in the end it was approximately fifty percent. So that's sort of I, I, to put it bluntly, I mean it's unaffordable in most systems. In, in grazing systems to achieve really high crude proteins like that, um, because it's mostly in that autumn and winter period, then some of those legume uh, just, just really aren't gonna be available. They're not, you're not gonna be able to hold them across that cold period. So that makes that um, really difficult. But of course, very good quality um, grass can hold crude proteins in the mid twenties, which is getting up there and it can hold it in the mid twenties across you know, a good part of that season, frost dependent, um, of course, but it can hold it for, uh, you know, a, a section of that season and in certain environments for most of that season. So in those cases, that co-grazing becomes um, a really effective system to do it. But functionally, the way that it works is you're not grazing on the beet and giving the rest of the crop, you're just putting out the beet with the beet bucket onto the, um, onto the pasture. Logistically, that seems to be the easiest way to achieve those crude proteins that you need. When it comes to hoggets, it's slightly different, of course. You don't need to have the same really, really high crude protein. But um, it can be achieved and it can be achieved well if you're very careful agronomically. If your cultivar selection is very careful and your agronomy, nitrogen inputs largely to those crops are, are really careful, then you can um, substantially crank the proportion of leaf. You can, without too much trouble agronomically, you can increase uh, the leaf proportion to be 35% of the total dry matter instead of 25% with nitrogen and plant spacing. And uh, on top of that, you increase the total crude protein of the bulb. And uh, in those cases, you can normally meet the hogget requirements without any difficulty at all. So the people who've done this and done that well um, are just much more careful in that cultivar and agronomic management of it. The supplement that's involved in those cases because it's still a relatively small amount simply has to be a relatively high crude protein supplement for hoggets so good quality pastures or um, as you put co-grazing systems where you've got standing cereals etc can meet that requirement or um, foliage within the bee paddock uh, just good quality grass foliage to be provided to them okay um, just moving on back to um, some very cold um, cold winters and heavy frosts. Um, are there any problems with animals accessing bulbs during long periods of, of cold weather? And, and you know, there's always the, the worry with farmers about the sheep's teeth as well. Yeah. Um, the, sh the short answer is no. Um, you know, on occasion we get half a metre of snow and the entire bee crops are underneath their feet and they're standing on top of it. Well, it takes a little bit of digging to get down to the peak in, in those cases. But um, uh, you know, as a general rule, the, the areas with our largest, um, by far with our largest uh, stock numbers on beet are in the central Otago region of New Zealand, which is high and pretty cold. Uh, it'd be pretty common to have um, negative five, negative 10 through a number of those areas. And that can last for some time. You can get snow events and you can get pretty strong cold weather events that might last for a few weeks. I mean, cattle and sheep will eat beet completely frozen, popsicle frozen, you know, literally a popsicle in front of you. They'll eat it frozen without any difficulty. Um, leaf loss in that cold frosted weather is never a problem. The leaf lost in winter when it's really cold, uh, so it's frosted and frozen. And if it's a very strong cold event like that, and then there's a thaw after it, then sometimes what you'll have is that leaf uh, will turn brown and stay there. It'll be sort of brown and slippery and it'll stay there. But the nitrogen content of that leaf is not very different than it was before. So you don't have an awful lot of nitrogen losses in the winter. Where you have agronomic losses to the leaf in beet systems are typically autumn. When it's drier and that leaf, very fungal disease and leaf foliar disease in general, affects that leaf and then it'll uh, disintegrate and blow away in the wind. And you've really lost that leaf dry matter then. In winter systems and even in the cold, you don't typically lose 
the dry matter out of that leaf in the same way? So the short answer is no, no great issue at all. I, I hear in the UK occasionally that people um, say that the higher dry matter varieties are better in that and that the lower dry matter varieties are not so good in the cold weather. That's, you know, I, I think it's a, a common misconception. Um, it, I don't think the cultivar type in terms of the dry matter of the bulb really plays any role at all in that. And certainly the lowest dry matter cultivar is the one that we've had the most experience in directly frozen environments. In fact, in, in my own research, I've fed it completely frozen, 25 below Celsius, completely frozen. So um, there's there's no great difficulties in, in that at all. They can eat that and they can eat it well. They chip away at it. Um, the, the thought is that uh, it's a bit harder work for them and so perhaps intake can be restricted, but because it doesn't seem to last for very long periods of time, we never notice anything from a production point of view. Okay, so um, more of a practical question now. So um, are there any suggestions for putting electric fences up in a strong top? So I know uh, I know with us at home, we hopefully if you're, you're grazing a row at a time, um, the quad bike works quite well going in the right direction. But uh, yeah. any other question? Yeah, I, I think there's two things to say here. I mean, number, number one, I mean, it can be a challenge with animals that aren't used to it. And it's just demoralizing, particularly with young stock to go back all the time and find them back across the crop. You know, that's that that, that can be pretty uh, challenging. But the, the the main solution to that, I think, is um, training, not not necessarily higher and higher electricity, but training. I mean, once stock get um, used to it and of course in beat systems, if, if we think about them carefully, there's very few environments where we're not um, feeding them fully. So I, I don't only mean um, feeding them to um, ad libitum, but also just the fact the energy um, supply is really high means that we're, we're feeding them really well. So as a consequence, they're, they're normally not putting a lot of pressure, particularly sheep, they're not putting a lot of pressure on the line. In many cases where that's going wrong is in terms of their allocation, as we've spoken about before, or um, seeking to do multi-day breaks where they actually become pretty protein hungry. So even though there's lots of bulb around them, they're still always putting a bit of pressure on the fence to get that leaf the other side of the fence there. On a practical level, how we would do it, I mean, in problem places, they'd be using a three wire fence instead of a two wire fence. And in very difficult um, circumstances, netting. I think in the earlier webinar, one of the pictures I had up there was some of the netting, electric netting that can be used and put through. And I mean, sometimes that can be used as a training tool for a little while and then that can be removed. But as a knockabout rule of thumb, two wires is good once they're trained onto it and it seems to work pretty well. You're right, putting the wheel across it can flatten it where you really need it and that can work too, but um, it's training probably more important. Okay. <clears throat> last, uh, last one or two questions. Um, obviously in the UK, it was a very, very wet winter. Um, a few farmers had issues with small lambs at lambing time after that. Um, what would have been the, the biggest cause um, or issue behind that, Jim? Well, it, uh, it's always difficult um, looking back on that, but if, if we were to take our similar experience, um, it's allocation and often uh, protein nutrition as well as energy nutrition. And in environments where you've got a lot of heavy soil and a lot of mud, number one, and number two, a fairly long distance for the animals to walk to the face, then at a certain point, they'll make a profit cost decision and it's just all too hard. And so what they'll do is they'll wait until the sun comes out on their back to eat again. So what you find is if you're not careful with some of that, you can have environments where you're forcing them with narrow paddocks, for example, at the end of a long, extended grazing season, they might have several hundred metres to tromp through the mud to get down to the face and then tromp back again if they're going to go to shelter. So what will happen is when they're sitting in that shelter, they'll think this is just all too hard. And so as a consequence, their, um, their intakes can be suboptimal. So, I mean, paddock design does come into play with that. Um, and walking long distances in very heavy environments is something that we do our best to avoid. The other component, though, is that... Um, you know, in the early days in New Zealand, our, our agronomy was was very much what all uh, what many of your listeners would be used to. It was sugar beet agronomy, effectively. 
There's no advantage in sugar beet in having more leaf. There's no, certainly no advantage in having as many of your sugar beet grubbers who are listening would know in having higher nitrogen in the bowl. In fact, you get graded for it. So, um, you know, a lot of the systems were tilted around uh, reducing nitrogen and, and that has a few effects. And one of them is uh, less leaf and less quality leaf held into that cold weather. So I, um, I'm guessing also that one of the issues around that would be provision of protein and the total energy intake and provision of protein. And remember, they're linked. If they don't get that protein, they stop eating, even if the energy is all around them. I, my, my first guess in that circumstances would be that. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Um, that's the end of the questions. So again, I'd like to say thank you very much to, to Reese uh, for joining us there as well. And um, just as a reminder, we've got uh, one final um, webinar in this series, which is on agronomy, and that will be on the 9th of November. So we look forward to seeing you all again then. Um, and as I mentioned, this series will also be running in Wales over the next couple of weeks. So again, thank you very much, Jim, and uh, we'll see you again. Good night. Good evening to the listeners. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Reese.